Welcome back to System Software. Uh, so last time we went over basics of processes, uh, the kind of basic theory of the process abstraction, what it was for, um, and how we can use some of the uh, standards around Unix processes like standard input and output um, in order to help us be more efficient on the command line when we're running processes. Today we're going to look at some more uh, sophisticated process management techniques on the command line. Uh, so just to review where we are, um, we went over processes last time, and this time we'll go over advanced processes. Okay, so recall last time that a process is uh, an abstraction or a virtualization or an idealization of the uh, CPU and RAM. The operating system provides each program with the illusion that it has exclusive access to the processor and RAM. And so the kernel will provide uh, uh, its own um, address space and uh, will maintain the illusion that the process is the only process running on the machine. Uh, but in actuality, there are multiple processes running, and it's uh, useful to be able to have processes communicate with each other. So to um, see how um, Unix designed uh, was designed around this this philosophy of process communication, uh, this is the um, some of the philosophy summarized in an old AT and T article. The the link is um, in the notes if you want to take a look at it. And I've highlighted two of the uh, point pieces of the philosophy here. One is to make each program do one thing well. Um, that way, instead of having to, whenever you have a new programming task, going down and programming in C, a, a new program, um, you'll have a set of programs that are already there for you to help you do the job. For instance, like cat or less or text editors or um, the, the programs that we looked at during navigation to help us navigate and modify the file system. The second one is more subtle, and we'll, we'll see how that, that works in the Unix philosophy, but the second one is to expect the output of every program to become the input to another as yet unknown program. And so this is kind of a subtle point in the Unix philosophy, but if you look at the uh, tools, the kind of standard tools that come with a Unix installation, these tools uh, tend to do one simple thing and have a pretty well-defined output and input. Uh, there's a lot of text processing um, that goes on. I've showed a, a couple of these um, when in the past couple of classes, but let me show an example of a couple of tools that you'll find in most Unix installations. So one is a program called Find, which, which sounds like it's a program to help you search, but really what it does is it just lists all the files in a file tree. You might be wondering, well, how's, how's that useful? Um, well, when paired with the second tool, grep, um, which searches for text in the input, you can see that if we could combine these two programs somehow, we'd have a tool for searching for files in our file system. Um, and so rather than us having to write some custom script or custom program to find files in a file system, we can actually use these two programs together. So let me uh, show an example of each of these programs here. So here I'm going to start listing, um, well, let me go into, let's say, the homework three examples. If I type find, find is just going to list all of the programs uh, in, the, in, the, in the tree. So I could save uh, these results sorry, list of files. I could save these results to a file using the redirection that we talked about last time. And you can see now this text file, list of files, now has the same output that um, find gave. Because we can redirect the standard out of find uh, with this arrow, we can save its output. And so then we can use uh, grep here, let's grep for say ACL. We can use grep, um, to look at the, uh, take this list of files as input. So here we're using the redirection of standard in to the grep program. 
um, in order to have grep read in the list of these files. And the syntax of grep, or the usage of grep, is to uh, give the program name, and then its first argument is a string pattern to match. So when I run, uh, when I grep for ACL on the input of list of files, it highlights for me the line of text that has that matches ACL. I can similarly match for say FS and it'll give me all the lines from the input that have FS in it. Now grep has lots and lots of options um, but for our purposes here we're just going to use this for um, looking for uh, a simple string in a text file. Okay so that's what these two programs do and we can use them together in a kind of clunky way by saving the output. But um, because the Unix philosophy has a standard input and output for every program, and that's, that's part of the reason for having that standard input and output is to satisfy that philosophy of, of assuming that the output of a program is gonna be used by some other program, so you can set up these uh, chains of tools, there's actually support in the operating system and in the shell for stringing together multiple commands and feeding their output of one command to the next command. So let me show this find example again without having to make a new file. So before I just ran find and then I ran grep say ACL. What I can do instead of having to save an output file like this, I can use a pipe to say, instead of redirecting the output to a file, redirect the output to the input of another program. In this case, we're gonna redirect the output of find into the input of grep. And so this command here will do the exact same thing as, uh, it will have the exact same output as these two commands where we saved the out, you know, we saved the output of find and then we read that output into grep and used it to search for a string. Instead, we can have the operating system manage this intermediate file for us. And because these programs have standard input and standard output, it's straightforward for the shell to feed, to redirect and feed the output of one program to the input of another program. And we'll actually, when we write our command line shell, we'll actually implement this, this feature in our own uh, simplified command line shell. All right, so let me show another example of using using a pipe. Here I'm going to use cat, which, if you remember, prints out the text, uh, writes the text of a file to um, standard out, or writes the, the bytes of a file to standard out. So here I'm going to use cat, which writes out uh, all the text of standard io.h. And I'm going to grep for the word head. So here we can see the word head appears on two lines in the input. You can grep for other things like include. So by combining printing of, of an entire text file, which seems sort of like, well, why would you need, you know, it seems almost uh, trivial to print out just the text of a text file. When piped, to other commands, we can combine these in non-trivial ways to quickly create a very complicated program from small pieces, kind of like Legos or, or building blocks. Putting components together in this standardized way through standard I.O. to build up larger applications that may be useful to you. Um, so if you've ever thought you need to do some quick task and thought, well, let me write a Python script or let me write some script to do it, if you learn um, the, the suite of these common tools that are available on the Unix system and understand the philosophy of using small, well-defined programs and chaining them together with their inputs and outputs, then you can build up useful uh, tools. So for instance, if I wanna count how often uh, an include happens or the word include appears in a header file, I can run cat to print out the text of that file, use grep to filter out only the lines that have included it. And there's another command called WC, word count, which will count the number of uh, characters, lines, and words in a file. So dash L just counts the number of lines. The, 
the actual tool is not that useful, but to, I just want to illustrate for you that you can combine these tools to get some sophisticated programming tasks done with very little programming effort. So here I've counted the number of lines that have include on it in this standard io.h file. Okay, so how do, how do pipes work under the hood? So take an operating system class, um, you may go into actually implementing how these work. Um, but you can think of, uh, uh, well, so let me, let me illustrate how this works at the, uh, at the OS level first. So what the operating system does is when, the, when Bash asks to create a pipe, the operating system actually has uh, built-in support for creating pipes. So the kernel will produce this pipe object. And so when you run find and say its output is, you know, let's say it's user bin, we just run find on, let's say we run find on the root. This is the output of find and grep. Let's say we want to grep for any instances of bin in order to feed the input and uh, the output of find into the input of, of pipe, the kernel creates special files. You might call these virtual files. And so this is where the, the file abstraction comes in handy because a file does not necessarily have to be data on disk. Uh, the file abstraction is just something that can be read, have its bytes read and written. And so the, cur the kernel can just fabricate a device storing it wherever it likes. It'll likely store it in RAM in this case, but it, the backing of the storage uh, doesn't matter because the uh, shell just needs to know that it has a file that it can write to. Uh, and so the kernel creates two files, one to be written to and one to read from, and the kernel will manage all of the communication between these, between these two kind of virtual files. So when the uh, shell writes or redirects the output of find or whatever the, the first command was when it redirects that uh, output into the pipe uh, input file, the kernel will automatically feed the uh, output into another file and the shell can redirect the uh, output of that file uh, into the in, standard in of grep. And so then it can give the output that we expect from combining these two tools. So how this actually works under the hood is, is more the subject of an operating system class. Um, but just think of, <clears throat> of pipe as two special or virtual files that the kernel creates, uh, one file that you write to and one file that you read from. Um, and through this pipe, we can communicate between processes. Okay, so let's show some more examples of, of piping commands. So there's another useful tool called xargs. So xargs will take each line from standard input and turn it into arguments for a given command. So for instance, this example here, it'll take all of the output of find, which recall, it just lists all the files in a subtree. Take the output of this, and xargs will use each line from the output of find, and it will pass it as arguments to the file command. So I can use a, a little trick to show you what will get executed by, by, um, by XARC. So it will take whatever program you, you gave to XARC's file here, and it'll pass each line of find as arguments to that program. So you can see here, find gives you this list of files here, and XARC's will turn a in list from the input, however it's generated, into arguments for the program you'd like to run. So if I run uh, find pipe its output to 
xargs and have xargs call file, recall what the file command does. The file command will uh, tell you what type of file a uh, will tell you what type of file you've you've got. So if I um, pipe the output of find to xargs file, this will run file on every file in the uh, output of find. So I could do this for say hello program to give something more more interesting here okay so that's how you can uh, turn uh, there's a special program called xargs that will turn standard input into arguments for a given command and so I can use uh, just these set of tools to build some pretty sophisticated uh, text processing tools so let's say I want to look for all .h files in the include directory. So they're probably almost exclusively .h files here, but not entirely. There are some non.h files. There are also directories, which I may not want to include. And so I want to filter out only those files that contain .h. So don't worry so much about the syntax of grep but this will give me all of the files that end with .h. And I can use xargs to print out the beginning of every file. So head will print out uh, the beginning of every file, but the, the point here is I can pass um, all of the output from this filtered find uh, into another command, this, in this case head. And so here we see the first three lines of, of every program. So I actually use this in, uh, in my research work. So I, I work on some uh, build system analysis and I can do some pretty sophisticated, uh, very simple, straightforward, but sophisticated analysis of some of the code. Uh, so just to show a quick example of this, I want to find all files in the, this is the, the Linux source tree. So this is all the Linux source code. I can uh, find all files uh, that have the name kconfig. And in these files are definitions of our definitions of configuration options. This config crash reserve, for instance. Uh, and so I can use xargs to grep and ask grep to look inside of each of these files, each each of the files that matches kconfig as found by find. Look inside of each one and find all cases, all lines from those files that match this pattern that start with the config keyword. And stringing together a few other, uh, stringing together a few other um, so let me uh, do a little command line hacking here. Stringing together a few um, other commands here. So for instance, I can um, just get, use cut to split the lines of code. And then to handle any duplicates, I can sort the list, find only the unique ones with unique. And take off the config keyword and count them with WC. So this will tell me all of the uh, unique configuration options that appear in the uh, Linux kernel build system. So anyway, I just want to show a more sophisticated case of combining together a whole string of tools to answer some questions that might be hard to write a, a, a new uh, fresh program for. Okay, so anyway, so there's a, there's a variant of pipe where you can um, pass both the uh, standard, so pipe will only pass the standard out by default, but you can, uh, there's a shorthand for passing the, both the standard error and the standard out. So for instance, if I were to use pipe here and look for some text, uh, 
this text is being printed out um, to standard error. So if I want to be able to match that text, then I can use pipe ampersand in order to uh, pass the text to, to grep. So if I wanted to look for something that wasn't there uh, without piping the standard error, I would still see the standard error. Okay, so that's pipe and some of the other more sophisticated things you can do with pipe. Let's turn to managing processes on the command line. So one of the what something that I think a lot of a lot of people sort of know already is that you can kill a long running program. So if I run find on the entire uh, file system, it's probably going to take a very long time to run. If I want to kill it, I can type Control C, and it will kill the job, or at least it will ask the job to uh, to stop. One you might be less familiar with is that a Control Z will pause a job. Um, so let me, let me actually show that, show that again so you can see the job being paused. So here we get a line from the shell that tells us that this command has been stopped. So um, it's not still running, but it um, the process still exists. So if we type PS to see the running processes in our current um, terminal session. You can see that the find program, it's still a process, but it's been paused. So, uh, so if we want to resume a job that we've suspended, we can use FG for foreground to continue running the job. So once I do FG, this find command, which is currently paused or suspended, will continue running. And I can use control Z to suspend it again. So foreground and background is really a, uh, a conceit of the shell. The, the operating system doesn't really distinguish between foreground and background. It's really about whether um, uh, the interactive shell can interact with the process. So a foreground process, um, I can hit control C, I can hit control Z, I can interact with it. I can see its input and output. The, if I use uh, B back, I make a background process instead, then I won't be able to interact with that with that process. So let me um, let me show what I mean with the uh, background process. So instead of FG, if I type BG for background to put this process in the background, find is running again, but I can't hit Control C and kill it because um, none of the signals that the shell is sending uh, will go to this process. Control C won't work, Control Z won't work. So what I can do is I can take this process and type FG. Oh, it actually finished running. So I can take this process, put it into the background, and in order to make it so I can interact with it again from the uh, terminal, I can type FG. You can't see it because the text is being moved so quickly up the screen. I can, uh, but I now have typed FG to put it in the foreground, and now I can use Control Z to suspend this, or Control C to suspend this process. So that's really the only distinction between foreground and background, and you can control whether a process that you've suspended goes into the foreground or background with FG and BG, these, these built-in commands in Bash. All right, so let me um, let me bring this into the foreground and kill it. So this is just uh, describing what I just described described to you. Uh, uh, yeah, showing you that I can um, kill it uh, by bringing it into the foreground. Um, all right, so let's let's um, let's show this ampersand sign. So ampersand, if you put ampersand at the end of a program or end of a uh, command it will immediately put it into the background. So for instance, if I ran find slash and use ampersand as the suffix of this, uh, I can't, I'm hitting control C now, I can't kill it because it's the, you know, I've told the shell to immediately run this process and put it into the background. But I can still use FG to bring it into the foreground. So I just typed FG even though the text was moved off the screen. 
and I'll type control C to stop it. And you can see here, I've stopped it by bringing it back into the foreground. So one thing to notice here is that the, even though I've put it into the background, the standard output is still flooding my screen with the standard output. Um, standard in is also being um, taken from, from the input, just no signals from control Z or control Z will, uh, will be received from the, from the shell. So we can actually have multiple, uh, multiple processes that we manage at the same time. So here I'm going to redirect the output of find into uh, dev null so I don't see it on the screen. Uh, so I've used ampersand to put the process into the background. You can see here the shell has told me the, the process ID and I can confirm that. Oh, actually it's running so quickly that I can't see it, but you can see here um, this is the find program running in the background. So it, it without having to write to the, to the shell, find and listing the entire um, file tree is so quick that, that uh, it ends pretty quickly. Uh, but I could run multiple jobs in the background and the jobs command will list all of the currently running processes and their state. So if I have multiple background processes, I can use the jobs command, you know, now, um, find exit already, but I can use the jobs command to selectively bring whatever job I'd like to the foreground. So they're numbered here. These jobs are numbered here. I can bring the grep command to the foreground here and continue interacting with it. You can see that um, this command is being run because we can tell because when I put in a, a line that had hello in it, it matched. So I've still got that cat program running, can bring it to the foreground and kill it. Uh, so it turns out that um, control C, you might think of control C as killing a process, um, but in actuality, it's really just asking the process to terminate. Um, these processes, these programs can be written to actually ignore this, uh, this command, um, but you can really kill the process. So even running kill on a process is just asking it to to be killed, um, but we can really kill it by using kill-9. So this will uh, send an uninterruptible signal to the process to uh, kill the process. So actually, it already exited. So let me show, show that in a faster way. So send this in the background and then kill the, um, so money sign exclamation point is just the uh, the last commands PID. So I'll use that to kill um, kill the, uh, the process, the find process in an uninterruptible way. Okay, so um, all this is to say is that uh, you don't have to remember all of this or how to use all of this, but one kind of quick and dirty way to do development quickly on a remote command line where, uh, you know, it's, it may not be obvious how to run uh, multiple processes. By using foregrounding and backgrounding, um, we can have a very quick and dirty development workflow um, using job control. So let's say I go in to edit my, my program here and, you know, let's say I've got a, I've got a bug. So I, I write this program, I've got a bug. Instead of quitting your editor, you can use control Z to suspend your editor. You can see jobs to confirm, and PS to confirm that indeed my editor is still running. And I can go to uh, run my compiler in the command line, see that I've got an error. So instead of going back and typing everything out to go back and edit my program, I can just use FG to immediately resume my, my editor go back, fix any bug, save it, suspend without quitting. Um, and I have a very quick and dirty development workflow here uh, using the job control that we have available um, in Bash. So there, there are better workflows, which I'll show you when we get to editing. Um, but this is really good for like quick scripting tasks, for instance, which um, something that I, I also use uh, frequently when especially using remote systems. 
Okay, so let's show a more sophisticated job management solution for um, remote systems. Um, these are called terminal multiplexers. There are local ones, there are remote ones. I'm going to show you one tool um, that will uh, you can use on a remote system. Eustis has it installed already. Uh, and um, yeah, so let's take a look at it. So Biobu is a wrapper for managing terminal multiplexers. Terminal multiplexers is just a way to have multiple terminal sessions from a single login. Um, so, so, let, so first, let's let's initialize Biobu. This is something you'll that you should run when you uh, first go into uh, Eustace. Run this Biobu Control A command and hit two for Emacs mode. Um, this is just uh, an, an historical thing. So, the terminal multiplexers traditionally use Control A to enter commands, but that conflicts with Emacs and Bash. So we're going to tell it to go into Emacs mode to actually use to not uh, capture this this command. So, so don't worry about this too much, the details of this, just for some initialization. OK, but let me show you what uh, Biobu does for us. So I'm going to type Biobu. And you'll see that it looks like I've almost kind of re-logged in. I have a new bash session here. I'm still in the same login session. I haven't re-logged in again. And then I've got this. Uh, status bar at the bottom with all sorts of information and you can configure this if you like their instructions in uh, in the uh, notes if you want to configure this so I can use the shell just as normal but if I'd like to do some other work let's say I'm editing in one window building in another or I need to do some system administration and I don't want to interrupt my current shell hitting F2 will give me a new bash session you can see at the bottom here that I've got a little indicator that will tell me which terminal session I'm in so I can switch between these sessions with so that was f2 with f3 and f4 i can move back and forth f3 goes left f4 goes right i can move back and forth and switch between these sessions so here i'm in screen one if i hit f3 it will move me back to screen zero there's a little highlighting and an asterisk to tell you uh, which which screen you're in so here i can show you that these sessions are ongoing. I haven't exited any bash sessions. And I can make lots of these. I can make one to compile and run and use the uh, shell history to very quickly compile and rerun. And I can use F2 and F3 to switch between different bash sessions without having to change directory or, or kill a session. So for instance, here I can go look at the include directory and all the while my other sessions are still active and running all right so normally well without any additional configuration the obu sessions should be retained across logins um, and you can see it's retained in the same login but uh, this system has been configured to kill user processes on exit. So yeah, you won't be able to use be able to save your sessions on Eustace. And this, I think, this kind of makes sense because uh, the sysmins probably don't want like thousands of users to leave <laughs> leave processes running. Um, so unfortunately, can't use that feature of Biobu. But um, you can still use it. And so you know, firing this up whenever you're going to do development um, is not so hard. You just uh, run Biobu, hit F2 to make new sessions, use F3 and F4 to move back and forth between them. Or alternatively, you can use Alt left and right. Um, at least on my terminal session, I could use that. Uh, and you can always just quit a window with control D or exit, just like you would a bash session.
Okay, so that's unfortunate, but let me go through the, so if you're on another remote machine that you control or that doesn't restrict um, uh, offline processes or processes uh, that you can run while you're logged out, then, um, then you can use that. But you can still use this to help you with running multiple processes, having multiple terminal uh, windows. Okay, so we learned a couple of things today. We looked at pipes. We can chain together multiple programs to do larger tasks. So here I just found every file path that has the word bin in it. So there's 32,000 of them apparently, more than that. So that's pipes. Um, you can manage processes. You know, the main things to look at here are the control Z for suspend. You can uh, go back, drop into your shell, run whatever programs you need to run, and FG to resume. And then we also saw um, Biobu for managing uh, remote sessions. So it won't preserve it on Eustace, unfortunately, but you can still use it for um, at least having multiple uh, windows open at the same time, multiple bash windows open at the same time, and navigate between them. So here I can swap between my editor and my compiler. All right, so that's it for advanced processes and see you next time. The homework for next time is to go through a tutorial of one of these two editors. Um, so these are two very, very popular command line only editors. Well, Emacs has a Windows mode as well, but these are editors that you can use on use this solely on the command line. Um, so I recommend Emacs. This is what I use. Uh, Vim is good to know because of its, its command set is commonly used in other applications. But Emacs, I think, is a great, great editor. I'd strongly recommend it. It's a little more intuitive to get started with, although uh, also a pretty, pretty uh, esoteric tool. Um, so for, for this, uh, until um, the, the next class, pick one of these. As I said, I recommend Emacs or do both and go through their tutorials. So to go through their tutorials, uh, these are accessible on the command line from Eustace. So for, for Emacs, just cut and paste this tutorial command, and this will open Emacs with the tutorial, and it'll have instructions in there to navigate the tutorial itself. So it'll, it'll tell you, you know, just read over the whole thing. It'll tell you to use control V to go to the next screen full of information, etc. cetera. Um, and if you, you know, get lost or get stuck, you can use uh, this quit command in order to leave. So control X, control C will quit. Uh, Vim has a special command called Vim tutor, which will open up its uh, tutor, tutor, its tutorial. And again, it has instructions for navigating um, for you. In here. Uh, it's quit command is also a little esoteric. It's colon Q and then enter to quit. So pick an editor. Um, I recommend Emacs, but uh, pick an editor or, or go through both. Um, these shouldn't be more than around 30 minutes or so to go through these, I, I don't think. Um, and then just answer a little little survey on what editor you chose, why, um, etc. Um, so that's yeah, that's all you need to do for for the next lecture. All right, thank you. Have a good week.